There's a story that the great Eddie Johnston loves to tell about how the year before he is the GM in Pittsburgh drafted Mario Lemieux. This team had no system, no minor league system. Well, it was a one-man minor league system, as EJ used to put it, because he would just call up this forward named Jim Hamilton. War number 13, I actually remember this dude. Little left-handed guy who could, whatever. He was exactly the kind of guy you could plug and play whenever you had an injury. He was with the Baltimore Skipjacks most of the year, and yes, that was a thing. And the rest of the year, he was up in Pittsburgh. And today, to an extent, it feels like a one-man minor league system, doesn't it? Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into football and or baseball, I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. And I hope you check those out as well. The Penguins are in Detroit. Well, some of the Penguins are in Detroit tonight for a preseason game against the Red Wings. That's a 7 p.m. faceoff at Little Caesars Arena. And it's going to be a lot like the two games that were split with the Blue Jackets over the weekend, uh, one in Pittsburgh and one in Columbus. The rosters will just be dotted with tryouts and minor leaguers. That's how it always is early in preseason. You know what? The other day, against the Blue Jackets, the Penguins kids held their own. If you watch those games, and I did after the fact because I was out in Las Vegas covering the Steelers, you'll see that the younger players, at least as much as I was able to pick up from the footage available, showed well. They skated well. They created well. They even had a couple of guys finish, and the guys who finished included some of the names that you would love to see show up on a score sheet, like Braden Yeager, like Sam Poulin, and even guys who are young-ish but on the fringe, like uh, Alex Nylander or Radim Zahorna. You had players who could possibly contribute in Pittsburgh contributing in these games, and not looking out of place. And yeah, I know, preseason this, preseason that, and the same is going to go for whatever it is that happens tonight against the Red Wings because they're not going to be using their guys either, just like the Blue Jackets didn't use their guys and the Penguins didn't use their guys. But if you're going to have your younger players or your minor leaguers Facing other teams, players in that same category, you would love to outperform them. And let's remember, as much as this was off of everyone's radar, unless you're the diehard of diehards, the Penguins won that prospects challenge a few days ago in Buffalo, and they did so through the same route. The players that you wanted to see show up, showed up. Now, I'm going to be honest with you here. It would take a much deeper dive on my end to come up with exactly why, whether it's the players growing up a little bit, whether they were under-evaluated beforehand, whether their level of instruction or development is already improving under Kyle Dubas. I don't know. I can't know that right now. Besides, the sample size makes it mostly immaterial. But I do know this. Yes, Please bring young players on. Give young players a chance, a real chance. Doesn't mean they have to make the roster out of training camp. We all know that's incredibly unlikely. I think Nylander's got a shot. Nylander is showing really well, really has the legs moving. And that applied both to the game against the Blue Jackets over the weekend and when I saw him out of training camp. He's moving. His feet are nonstop, and that is not what he was a little bit after he came up last season. You might remember that he showed extremely well upon first being recalled, fit right in on a line with Evgeny Malkin, and it was like, wow, where's this guy been? Why were they hiding him in Wilkes-Barre? And then after that, you didn't notice him at all because he just stopped skating. 
he started seeing himself as someone who could operate from a standstill, and that doesn't make any sense, especially considering who his brother is. That dude never stops. So that's good. That's good is what I'm saying. You want Nylander being one of the people who challenges. You want Valtteri Pustinen being one of the people who challenges. You want, no, you actually need Sam Poulin to be one of those. And in a in an indirect kind of way, you actually want Braden Yeager to be one of those. Because he can then go back to the WHL with more confidence, uh, more sense of awareness, more sense of how high the hill is for him to still climb. Great. Awesome. I am not naive here. I am not pretending that the Penguins have a solid system. They don't. Kyle Dubas knows that. Tom Kostopoulos knows that. J.D. Forrest knows that. But they've got to work toward building it up. I'm not one of those who obsesses about life after Sid. But there will be life after Sid. And even though you'll give up draft picks to go and get yourself an Eric Carlson or a Ricard Raquel. And heck, who knows, maybe another one by the coming trade deadline. You have to find a way to work your rear ends off as a collective to make sure that there's still a pipeline. You can't just leave it at Jim Hamilton and a bunch of crossed fingers. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from Zach, who says, DK, I've been watching the Penguins my whole life, and I feel like I'm pretty knowledgeable. I've never put that much, if any, thought into which defensive pair plays with which forward line five on five. Maybe that's because I've never seen a team with two true number one defensemen like the Penguins have now, but it just feels like with the ice time disparity between forwards and defensemen, they end up mixing and matching quite a bit anyway. That said, if they find themselves coming off a TV timeout with an offensive zone draw with all options available, I want Eric Carlson out there with Sidney Crosby. You know what, Zach? This is going to be a fun discussion as we move through even the preseason. Once you start getting those guys in, and that'll come at the very end, usually only one game for them. But everything's going to be picked apart, including the practice alignments, and it should be. This is an extraordinary circumstance. I don't know that I agree with you that it's two number one defensemen for the first time in a long time, and I say that only out of respect. Please don't laugh at me for this, for what Justin Schultz did in 2017 in rising up in the absence of Chris Letang. I thought he was remarkable. I thought it was a borderline, and I'm using this in the sports context, heroic performance on his part. To play the way he did, I think he played out of his own mind, meaning I don't know that he's ever played like that before or since, but that was two number one defensemen. And for those of you who go way back, there was a time when Paul Coffey and Larry Murphy were on the blue line here. You can throw a few other combinations into that mix, I'm sure, depending on the level of debate that you want to engage in, but they've got two now. They've absolutely, unquestionably got two elite and both right-handed defensemen. In a perfect world, one would be a righty and one would be a lefty, and you could set yourself up with a 28 minutes a game shutdown pairing. But that's not the world that we live in. So one of the many intriguing things that's going to follow is, can Marcus Pedersen and Ryan Graves match? the ice time that the two stars do. And if they can't, how does Todd Reardon balance that with other left-handed defensemen? Who does he throw out there? How much does it disrupt either Latang or Carlson in any given situation? Look, there's a lot that goes into it. But, and I'm going to say this stressing context, okay? If you're Sid... And you're a creature of habit, since this is the subject that you brought up at the end of what you sent here. You are going with what you know a billion percent of the time. 
he's not just superstitious. He is outrageously aware of everything around him in all settings on and off the ice. He lives for predictability. If that makes him boring, so be it, because it's worked, to say the least. People talk about Jake Gensel's future in Pittsburgh. No, there's there's no there's no talk to be had there. He's Sid's left winger. He's not going anywhere unless he wants to, and he doesn't. Look at what it took to get Brian Rust off his line, even when Ricard Raquel came in and was just gelling with Sid as if they'd known each other all their lives. Instantly, like that, even when they weren't on a line together, just when they would get stuck out there for a shift or two. Sid knows Latang. Sid can feel everything that he wants, and he can he he can find a way. Oh man, what do I want to say here without saying it? There's different ways to sell this whole concept. Okay, there's different ways to sell. Listen, Gino, you get Carlson. You know, <laughs> I mean, you can say anything you want to anybody if you're Sid. And they're going to listen because you're Sid. And this is not at all a disrespectful assessment on my part. This is what Sid actually should have for an audience. And he does. He does. He's deserved that. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We're going to do another one of these tomorrow. 